let's get started with our first panel on genetics and broodstock. I would like now to welcome our first group of panelists to talk about the different methods and technical best practices that they use that help build a strong trout breeding program. So today we have Sean Nepper from, he is the Chief Brood Officer and Vice, Pre Vice President of Fish Health at Riverence Trout Farms. We have Maureen Ritter, who is the Managing Director of Canada Cryogenetic Services. We have Dr. Maurice Medley, Senior Breeding Program Manager at Select Genetics. And, and we have Arlen Taylor, who is the owner of Cedar Crest Trout Farm. Welcome everyone, welcome to our panelists. I see Sean, I see Maureen, we'll just wait for, there's Marie and Arlen. Hello, welcome everyone, thank you for being here. Um, our, as you as you can see for our audience, Arlen is right now in at Cedar Crest Farms. Um, Arlen, maybe I can start with you and tell us where you are and tell us a little bit about the program there at Cedar Crest. I'm currently moving in a trailer with someone new pulling my trailer. So, oh. you know, if ever or this happens, I apologize greatly. Um, as mentioned, my name is Arlen Taylor. I am a second generation fish farmer um, from Cedar Crest Trout Farms. And uh, we have been in operation here at this facility since 1995. I come from a family that was uh, involved in fish farming since 1969. Uh, our breeding program is uh, virtually a, an old school rendition of you know what has been done. And we try to bring in modern technology as we go into pieces. Um, and uh, as we as we bring pieces in, and so we still use you know the basis of multiple different strains, hybridizing, hybrid vigor, um, but we put them through some production goals. And our breeding facility, um, we have two of them, uh, but our main breeding facility involves every one of our breeders having to go through two and a half years of um, extreme surface water variant. Um, basically, that means that we are not keeping them in a closed containment grass facility. These guys are exposed to river water. Um, they're exposed to temperatures as low as 0. 0.6 degrees Celsius and as high as 28 degrees Celsius. So this is the way that we have been working to create a better uh, fingerling and offspring for our clients. Um, and here at our facility, we have nine different strains of fish that we hybridize. Um, our oldest uh, dating back to 1953, its introduction into Canada um, with many variances. As farms have shut down all over the country, um, we have purchased any or all brood stock that they had remaining um, to try and rehabilitate certain strains or try to hybridize them with some of our own. So it's been a very robust program. Um, we breed between, depending on the year, uh, 15 to 25 million eggs, um, all rainbow trout. And uh, yeah, I'll be open for questions later. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. And thank you, um, I'm sure we'll have, the audience members will have some great questions for you. Um, Sean, I'd like to go to you now. I um, Can you give us a little bit of an introduction about your work there at Riverence? Yeah, thanks, Jean. Um, my name is Sean Nepper. I work with Riverence, one of the largest trout producers in the United States. Um, we also, we were a little bit different in the fact that uh, we are pretty close to vertically integrated as far as we do our own brood stock. And uh, we also produce our own fish on our own farms, around 25 million round pounds of trout a year. And uh, then we are, we go all the way to distribute, distributing that product um, in fresh and frozen form across the United States. So. As far as the, the breeding programs, we do Atlantic salmon, uh, coho salmon, and rainbow trout. Uh, we Of our rainbow trout, we have six different strains that we operate, um, and uh, we do that both in Washington and Idaho. So. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to hearing more. Um, Marie, uh, you work with many farms through Select. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Hi, thanks, Jean. Um, it's great to be here today to talk a little bit about what we're doing in trout. Um, I'm the head project manager for a company called Zelect Limited. So for those that don't know, we're an aquaculture genetics company. We're a consultancy um, based in Scotland. And 
What we're really doing is trying to put a genetic lens on broodstock operations and provide management services around that. Um, we believe ensures that producers can stay commercially viable and will secure their competitive position. So we secure the commercial viability through maintaining genetic diversity, essentially. So for species such as trout, a small number of animals can contribute to a large number of offspring, particularly, for example, the males. Um, so if you don't have that individual and pedigree level information, um, it can be a one way ticket to inbreeding and the negative connotations that come with that. Um, and we also secure a competitive position just because genetics allows you to implement permanent and cumulative gains in the traits that you're interested in, such as growth and robustness. And the sooner you get started, the better chance you have at keeping up with your competitors already doing it or outstripping those that are not doing it. Um, in terms of trout, we're operating multiple trout breeding programs around the world for our customers um, and also in other salmonids as well, including Chinook and multiple Atlantic salmon programs. Um, so the current status of our customers uh, is quite varied. We have those that are very well established. They've turned over multiple generations and they're now seeing genetic gains. Um, and we also have customers that are just getting started and we're trying to help establish trait selective systems for or diversifying their stock. Um, and our customers aren't limited to uh, trout and salmonids either, as you mentioned. So we work on any in fish and shellfish um, and our customers vary as well in scale and product. So we're producing for integrated producers, so customizing programs for integrated production um, and also seed supply operation as well. Um, the trout is a fish that's farmed all over the world in all sorts of environments. Um, and a few years ago, we were implementing a uh, campaign for genetic health checks for trout to verify the stock health and suitability for continued breeding. Um, we have a genetic tool called a SNP panel that we essentially use to do all of those kind of genetic uh, statistical analysis. Um, and that's something that we can use basically on any uh, trout population in the world. Um, it's quite, it's a affordable panel, so it helps to keep the cost down for the customer and gives you enough information um, to know like where you're going with selective breeding and if, and if your population is viable for that purpose. Um, and then in terms of trait portfolios for our customers, we're uh, predominantly concerned with growth, fat, uh, skeletal amalgamations, fillet color, fillet yield, uh, maturation, GSI, um, disease resistance and robustness. Uh, we have good phenotyping methods already established for growth, fat, skeletal malformation, fillet color, fillet yield, and maturation that we've got moderate high heritabilities and EBV accuracies for. And we also have a particularly nifty tool for measuring fillet color as well, where we can use this high throughput image processing software to, to measure uh, pretty comprehensively fillet color for thousands of images in a matter of hours. Um, Another particularly great service we have uh, that, that's specific to trout is uh, for the sex determination and triploidy. Um, so a lot of people obviously uh, farm all, fe all female triploid trout. Um, so we provide certification processes so that you're actually can be sure that what you're farming or what you're receiving is indeed all female and triploid. Um, so that's a little bit of a whistle stop tour of like what we do and what specifically we're doing for trout. Thanks so much, Marie. We'll we'll get to know Select a little bit more as we go on to this panel, but I'd like to introduce Maureen here. She's in a remote lo location, so she's online with us um, via audio. Um, hi, Maureen. Can you give us a little bit of an introduction to cryogenetics? Um, you're a little bit um, different because you work with both enhancement program hatcheries and aquaculture food production, right? Hi, yeah, thanks, Jean. Um, yes, I'm Managing Director of uh, Canada Cryogenetics, and, and uh, we're a global company, and we specialize in crow preservation species. Trout is just one of the ones that uh, we work with. And uh, yes, I work with uh, conservation hatcheries and aquaculture companies. So um, differences, but similarities. And uh, we basically uh, work globally with trout. Um, so yeah, we uh, um, basically provide many services, not just the crowd preservation and storage. We also provide technical support for various operations as well. Um, so for the farmers, I wanted to get a question for Arlen um, and Sean, I'll ask you this as well. Um, what is the um, genetics program on your farm in terms of like, where where do you get your genetics from? Um, 
is it are you culturing in house and sort of what are the advantages and disadvantages to um, the program that you guys have for your respective farms. Um, it looks like Arlen is a little bit busy right now. So Sean, maybe I'll start with you first. <laughs> yeah, no, I can go first. Uh, so um, it kind of depends on the strain that we're talking about. Um, some of the strains that we have on site have been on site for 26 to 30 years. So um, we do have a, a closed system that we do manage inbreeding on. Uh, and that's in conjunction and, and a lot of help from USDA RS to kind of fact check us every couple of generations. Uh, but that's really, we have to do that because we sell a lot of eggs internationally. So some of the things that we need to do for health certificates and under o OIE requirements and, and such, we need to like have a closed loop on what our genetics are so that we can keep control of the disease testing for export of eggs. Uh, to a lot of different countries. So um, there's not a lot of breeding, uh, bringing in of new genetics. Um, if we do, it's, uh, I mean, we haven't done it in a long time. So it's just, uh, it's something that we don't typically do. Okay. Uh, we're a lot of what we do is family-based breeding, quantitative genetics. Uh, we're just a small farmer in the sense that in our breeding programs where some of the molecular programs aren't necessarily available to us uh, on big scale. So, uh, but we're working towards that and it's not something that we're against. It's just, uh, we're working up to it, so. Yeah, definitely. Um, Arlen, could you give us a little bit about uh, the history of your genetics program there? And um, I know similar to Riverends, you guys also provide genetics to other farms as well, right? Uh, yeah, so our genetics uh, lines uh, vary from coast to coast. Um, it started with uh, the 1953 strain that came in was the original McCleary strain, um, which is not similar to the origins of Trout Lodge. Um, we have Kamloops strains. Um, we have what is referred to in Ontario as the Ganaraska strain, uh, which is uh, uh, the strain that is used for conservation. Uh, we have a hybrid strain there um, that we use uh, together with the MNR here. Um, we have many, many variances. Uh, we, we've inherited from our forefathers. So our, our forefathers uh, would go fishing and they would bring eggs in in alternative ways of which I will not repeat while being video. Um, <laughs> but uh, there is great variance within our strains. We do genomic testing and assays on them to see the level of variance that we have in our different groups. We do breed um, for strong and varied fish. So uh, one thing that is kind of across all of our strains specifically is that they do not necessarily grow in a nice uniform pattern. Um, they do grow very strong. We only do mixed sex diploids uh, as a means of dealing with climate change. Um, and uh, they, they, different strains have different places that they can go in Ontario. Um, we also ship to Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Quebec, um, and Alberta. Um, but within those strains, um, there are some that are better catered to colder environments. There are some that are better better for hotter environments or hypoxic environments. So we work together with our clients um, to see what they really need at the end of the day um, and try to build them the best fish uh, with the history that we have. Um, we have a very, our, our program revolves around feedback. So it's feedback of what we're doing on our own facilities. We have six facilities here in Ontario. Um, getting all of those production values, all of those goals, looking at those hybrids and continually doing a feedback loop into the brood program. Um, so using that data is really what helps us create future generations whilst respecting our, our previous strains and trying to keep them, you know, pure and, and comfortable the way that they need to be. Um, but for our clients and for our own grow out production systems, it's looking at what is the best hybrids that need to go to a specific facility. Okay. Um, Arlen, while I have you, I was interested as you guys were all talking, I had a thought about, you know, what, when is it advantageous to rely on, you know, out, outsourcing, you know, gen genetics and so your um, genetic, uh, relying on genetic suppliers, as opposed to farmers that run their own broodstock programs? Like when do you, well, um, when do you and when do you not to? So my dad is uh, one of two uh, in Ontario that still have their own breeding programs. Um, you know, uh, in the early, in the late 90s, early 2000s is when that 
many, many small farms uh, decided to opt to a genetics company, be it uh, here in Ontario. Normally, we we use trout lodge and more recently riverets. Um, and it, it does take a lot of money, a lot of time um, to maintain those breeding populations. So in the course of the last 20 years, they've all but dissolved. My father had a thought and he just said, you know, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, I'm not going to give it up. And he was involved with another farmer um, who was the one that had brought the genetics in in 1953. And they both agreed to keep their families in perpetuity and see where it goes. Um, there have been many things that have happened over the years, you know, border closures, new testing, driving the price up for, you know, eggs coming from outside, um, all of these different areas. And we have held strong in keeping this breeding program. So our breeding program has evolutionized a lot over the years. My dad used to run very small subpopulations. We run them much larger um, so that we're capturing caviar sale or not row sales, either for the bait market or for human consumption as a means of keeping or maintaining our breeding program as big as it is. Um, so we had to get a little creative um, in order to to actually make it work. Now, as you know, the climate change as climate change is becoming such a huge issue. Um, and some pathogens as well, especially here in Ontario, having a born and bred Ontario fish that can handle especially temperature variants and hypoxic environments has proven to be a really excellent thing for a number of growers and help them get through. Um, we do have a, a few growers here in Ontario that have been steadfast for my father and now for me um, in believing in what we do. And uh, we're sort of the sole, um, sole proprietor when it comes to eggs for them. That being said, we cannot produce eggs 12 months of the year. So I work uh, closely with Sean Nepper and he helps me fill in some voids um, that I have in my own production um, or we do not produce triploidy. So we will bring those in as well. So things like that, it, it's, it's not necessarily that one size fits all for everyone. Um, for us, it has been about building the Ontario fish specifically or an answer to climate change to the best of our capacity. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sean, I'll I'll go to you next and talk about the reverence perspective on this. You know, um, what is what is the advantage of having an in-house program? And you talked earlier about the considerations as a company of expanding further from where you are. Um, yeah, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I think uh, our you know, our CEO and the founder of, of Riverance kind of identified pretty early that um, when you try to do a lot of, when you sell eggs internationally into a lot of different farms, every farm is different, every environment is different. So getting feedback on how to make breeding decisions becomes pretty difficult. Um, so he identified that uh, we should really look at some farms early in the Hagerman Valley in Idaho, which is one of the largest uh, trout producing regions in the United States. And kind of put our own our, our own breeding principles and genetics out on our own farms, and where we could really capture good data and inform breeding decisions back, and see how those all all relate. Um, and so we started buying farms in Idaho, and uh, it's kind of snowballed up until now. But it really does give us um, uh, a, a big. Uh, common garden playground to where we can play with our genetics and and we can turn quickly on uh with breeding decisions that that, that matter um we do some things with disease resistance um we have in that valley we have an issue with uh ihnv and so um we do do some strains where we look at how that uh how that pathogen affects what we do and how we grow fish um, but also kind of like what Arlen was saying, we do a lot with uh, what's going to be happening in the environment. Um, not necessarily what's happening now, but we look at 10 to 20 years down the road, what's going to be happening. And, and I think we all know that global warming is happening. Temperatures are increasing in water uh, all over the world. And so uh, we do a lot with thermal challenges on, on broodstock. We do a lot with hypoxia challenges. Uh, we look a lot at stress response in fish. And uh, and so those are all things that we think are important for the future. And uh, we've been able to test that on our own farms. So 
Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, I want to get Marie and Maureen's uh, perspective on this as well, but because we're at the halfway point, I just want to remind our attendees here um, to, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, to put them on the Q&A box. I'm going to start uh, looking at those in maybe less than 15 minutes, a little bit more than that, actually, um, so for the Q&A session of this session. Um, but Marie, I'll go to you next um, and talk about from Select's perspective, what are you able to offer those who, as Arlen and Sean says, it takes capital to bring in this breeding, breeding program in-house. So where the how can Select come into play for the for your clients? Or I mean, I think as the other guys have said, um, basically with trial in particular, I mean, production systems are incredibly diverse. Um, so you're getting your eggs from another seed supplier that potentially isn't interested in the same things that you might be interested in. So there's always that risk. Um, so if you have your own in-house centralized breeding program, then that ultimately is going to be tailored to like what your production requirements are. You know that you're selecting animals that are performing well in your environment. Um, the barrier to entry really there is um, the facilities and the technical team that's behind it. Um, so it goes without saying that if you tap into our services, you're basically getting access to that broader team that financially otherwise might not be feasible to achieve on your own for some producers. So uh, we're a team of multiple quantitative geneticists, in-house laboratory, uh, project and aquaculture broodstock managers. Um, we can come and help you like set things up on the ground. So, you know, if you're really starting from zero, um, and you've not managed these kind of operations before, like we can go in and tell you what you need to do, train you in the systems that you need to work with um, to start doing that. Um, and we can also identify for you as well, sensible routes to take regarding your broodstock management. Um, so the traits that you're interested in that may or may not be worthwhile uh, going down the road of. Um, and we also have simulation software as well and uh, bioeconomic modeling software. So we can kind of direct your route of investment if you are going to go down this route. Uh, generally speaking, um, it's entirely possible for anyone really to operate their own breeding program. Um, what depends is like what material you have available. So perhaps your material isn't incredibly diverse. Um, so it could be quite limiting to, to start with. We can help you with that, with advising like whether you need to introduce more animals to pump up your variation. Um, beyond that, um, really, I think what's ultimately important to remember is that you're, you're ultimately concerned with what the end performance is. Um, so even if you're interested in like setting up your own breeding program, it's still worth looking at like, you know, what are the, uh, what is the performance of different egg suppliers in my system and how well is that working, right? Um, because ultimately we're interested in like how well these uh, animals perform. Uh, and it's just something to bear in mind that as we're going, as you're going along, you want to be well aware that the, the end, the end goal is important, right? Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. I know in both Arlen and Sean's um, answers, they were talking about how important it is to, you know, develop these fish and develop these generations according to their local environment. So how are you able to do that for different regions around the world? Well, I think ultimately, like, yeah, every producer has got very different challenges and conditions. So um, we are you know, if we're, if we're looking at sample hypoxia and temperature tolerance came up um, a few times. So one of the, the simplest ways to actually measure trait performance is just measuring the animals that grow best in your environment. So, you know, send them out to your sea cages that you're rearing them in, uh, genotype the animals, um, measure the growth. And then the ones that ended up bigger at the end of that period are going to be the animals that survived against all odds and performed well against all odds. Um, but then obviously there are other things that we can do as well to look more specifically at those traits and bump up the genetic gain for specific things that we're interested in. So we can genotype mortalities and survivors in a population to measure survival against specific outbreaks or challenging environments. Um, and we can also do like tank based challenges as well. So in the cage environment, there's a lot of environmental noise, a lot of those factors at play. Um, so you don't want to inadvertently be selecting for something that's case specific to that year. You want to be selecting for something that's the persisting factor that you're experiencing every year, whether that's high temperature, low oxygen or uh, specific resistance to disease. Um, so tank based challenges like offer that um, 
the environmental control. Um, and uh, so, yeah, th those are really the kind of different levels that, that we can look at. The, the other, um, without get, jumping ahead too much, uh, for disease resistance, um, genomic prediction tools are kind of like the generally the best tool to use now for those kind of traits. They just give you that much more accuracy to like relate those uh, resistant animals that you've seen in your disease resistance population um, against the candidates that you're going to be using for your, your brood stock that you're stripping. Um, the way we do that is with the high density genotyping panels, which is something that we're now offering at Select. And it just gives you a little that little bit more uh, genetic gain uh, for those kind of traits. Before, it's been very inaccessible for producers, and I, I'm not convinced that it's necessarily always that there is a barrier to entry on the cost, because most of the cost, I think, is really around the overall operation of the centralized breeding program. Um, for implementation of genomic selection and disease resistance, like we perceive that as generally it's like generally a modest uh, cost to implement those things. Um, but more, it's just the actual like financial appetite to to implement that. So what we're trying to do at the moment is uh, present to customers and producers the scenarios, the economic gains that you will potentially see uh, implementing those kind of tra traits against what the investment would be in the disease resistance and genomic prediction technology. And it gives producers a little bit more confidence that like that that level of investment is is worthwhile. So they said it's normally quite modest against the overall production cost of the operation. Okay. Um. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for that, Maureen. Uh, Marie. Sorry. Um. Yes. I wanted to go to Maureen next. That's why I wanted to. That's why I slipped up there. Um. Maureen, for the cryogenetics perspective, um. You know what? How does cryogenics or cryopreservation come into play? Um. For example, for enhancement programs versus aquaculture programs. Thanks, Jean. Um, so for aquaculture programs, uh, crowd preservation comes into play for a genetic backup for your family breeding. Um, you don't have to have another tank of family fish and another tank of family fish and another tank of family fish. You can just cryo preserve and have those genetics backed up. It also works as a production backup in case of a, a disaster of any kind. Uh, if you have your milk frozen uh, in stored in liquid nitrogen, it's there to be used in case of a production failure of any kind, <clears throat> as well as out of season production of eggs. So uh, as we heard, um, as we heard uh, various people say, you know, you're supplying uh, fish year round, and that means you need eggs year round. Um, so if you have the crowd preserved milk, you have that ability to be producing um, the eggs year round. Um, the other thing is, of course, uh, key males with specific characteristics can be crowd preserved and used for specific customers' orders in, in the area of sending selling eggs or fry. Um, you have a customer that wants a certain trait in their eggs that they're purchasing. Um, you can then take that from your frozen milt. Um, in the case of growth rates, flesh color, disease resistance, temperature variations, all of the things that we've heard from the producers already this morning, uh, those males can be frozen with their various characteristics and taken out to be used for each customer's orders. Um, so the crowd preserved milk can be used at any time and it's a cheaper alternative over several live fish backups. Um, with regards to the conservation facilities, uh, again, it's used as a genetic backup, long-term gene banking, so that if something happens to those fish, uh, you're able to restart that population again. Um, with regards to climate change, natural disasters, man-made disasters, or even diseases in conservation hatcheries, it's the same idea you've got that frozen milk to be able to restart or have as a gene bank. Um, species at risk, uh, basically that's another reason. One of the um, you know various governments that we work with uh, globally, they have gene banks uh, for the species that are, are on the edge and you're able to repopulate those species in the, in the times when required. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you, Maureen, um, we've talked about this previously, how far back, back can the milk be pre preserved? Because we've talked previously about, you know, these enhancement programs, and there's quite a few enhancement hatcheries that are online with us today. Um, how far back can those genetics 
um, be preserved. So technically they can be uh, cryo preserved forever. Um, we currently have milt in storage uh, for 30 years that shows absolutely no problem with the uh, viability when thawed and used. Um, as long as it's kept in the nitrogen and the nitrogen levels are kept up then and frozen at all times, then the milt is uh, fine. And that's why we provide the storage service um, to clients. Um, a lot of times people have had a doer of milt and oops, forgot to fill it. So we provide the storage in biosecure facilities where that nitrogen level is checked so that you do have that uh, for long term use. We have, uh, we are the storage provider for um, various stocks around the world that uh, are endangered. We hold the gene banks for various uh, governments around the world. All right. Thanks, Maureen. We have about seven minutes before um, we're going to transition into the Q&A period for the audience here. But I wanted to talk about next, um, you know, how different is you know, treating trout, um, the trout species and the trout breeding compare program in comparison to, you know, others in the salmon family, you all work on, on, on different species in the salmonid family. So um, in comparison to something like an Atlantic salmon, how different or how nuanced is a trout breeding program um, compared to those? Uh, Arlen, is it okay if I go to you? So admittedly, I don't have a very, I'm a trout girl, born and raised. Um, only in recent history uh, have I gone into other species. Uh, uh, much, much easier for other people that have more experience, uh, Sean, um, to deal with things like coho salmon. And again, we, we kind of go back, revert to your previous question. How big does your program need to be to be viable? How many, you know, how many offspring are you hoping for to get there? So in the land of rainbow trout, that is very much where we are. Um, I think our, our single largest difference is not a terminal spawn. Um, nothing that we do um, for the first uh, three cycles is a terminal spawn. Um, so that continuation um, of genetics, which offers some great benefits. Um, it allows sort of a natural uh, a, a natural flow to make sure that we're, you know, we're getting the data feedback and allowing for all of that to happen. Um, in in the case of uh, in the case of Dealing with our rainbow trout, you know, we could also play a little bit with maturation time. Um, so dealing with, you know, three years and four years uh, for maturing classes of fish, um, which is something that varies greatly with, you know, other species. Um, one thing that we also, a great advantage that we have in rainbow trout is that we have selected over the course of 50 years, um, fish that spawn at different periods of the year. So I do not have to photo period. I do not have to induce um, maturation uh, or ovulation for any of my fish, I've naturally selected that over the course. That being said, I, I don't quite get 12 months of the year, I get uh, I get 10, um, but regardless, uh, you know, we've gotten to those places. So some of those natural manipulations that we've been able to achieve that aren't quite so locked down as other species. Okay, um, Sean, how about with you and with Riverends, how are you balancing the different, the differences in terms of what a trout breeding requires versus the other salmon family species that you work with? No, Gene, it's a good question. Uh, you know, trout, we, we do we do all three species almost year round now. Um, and that was the biggest challenge. Rainbow trout we had very, uh, very quickly um, where we were using, unlike Arlen, we use photo, uh, photo periods to control that. So we have uh, year round production of rainbow trout. Um, but it was, you know, the Atlantics where we got year round pretty, pretty tight now, but coho it was very, it's still, we only can cover about three quarters to a half of the year right now. Uh, but what, what our biggest challenge is space, um, you know, on our, with our spawner of a rainbow trout, we get our first spawn at two years of age. And then we put them in a photo period where we will um, get most of the other eggs for year round production as a three-year-old. And then um, they're done and we turn the genetics, the next population comes in. And so they're on a two year generational turn. Uh, now Atlantics, we go closer to a, a, a three or four year old spawner. And so you're just holding that biomass, that broodstock longer. There's, uh, 
more that can happen in, um, especially in Washington for us, it's a, a partial reuse system. So uh, there's just some more challenges with that. Uh, but um, for the most part, how we breed in the family selections and things like that, all of them are very similar. We all look, but they just look at different things in each one of the species. Um, the only other challenge that we've we've come across is uh, for all female production, uh, the rainbow trout uh, we had pretty quick. Um, it was fairly easy, straightforward, a lot of literature on it, um, worked on it for many, many years uh, before coming to Riverance. So uh, in Atlantic salmon, very it was pretty easy to, to kind of get that going, but coho has been a challenge. And I think we've, as of this last year, we've kind of figured out how to get all female production uh, consistently out of coho. So. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, Marie, similar question to Arlen and uh, Sean here. Um, we've talked about also previously about um, navigating the the information that's available for you know something like Atlantic salmon or coho salmon, and the information how much of that is transferable to mm -hmm. trout, and how do you kind of um, yeah. educate people on the nuances of that. I guess like touch back on a couple of the interesting points that Arlen and, and Sean have already uh, made um, regarding like, for example, the pure old maturation, like from a genetics point of view, like something that we have to try and consider is like the timing of like when all the information becomes available for a selective breeding. Um, so if you have a two an animal that matures at two years old, but then your harvest time is roughly about the same time you've got to make sure that basically all that genotyping is done all the analysis is wrapped up um, all in time for um, doing your selections and your breeding um, so that's something that uh, yeah for a couple of our trout customers we have to like work pretty hard to like make sure all that analysis is done pretty quickly but because we have an in-house laboratory and everything's all under the hood um, then you know we can respond to those kind of tight deadlines um, and then also about the neomale production as well like so and because you're producing all females, so you need to be pretty sure um, that you've done uh, correct masculinization in, in the early days. Because if you don't have sufficient animals later on, that's not only going to impact um, your production potentially, but it can also put a squeeze on your genetic gain because you'll have high inbreeding control restrictions. Um, so on the flip side, we've got pretty good software that essentially ensures that the selected animals are going to be the best of a given scenario. So we can do a lot of um, damage control in that situation. Um, but those are all things that we kind of like need to have sight of and make sure you've got sufficient um, backups. Um, but like one thing that I think is probably quite from a select breeding point of view, like one of one of the interesting differences is just the fact that, you know, a lot of people are using triploidy. Um, so a lot of crop production is triploidal female populations. Um, this, of course, does complicate genetic management because triploids are sterile and for the breeding population, triploid populations have to be maintained and near males produced from the all female stock. Um, so triploids do have some physiological characteristics which are different, and this has implications for the traits that you're going to be um, evaluating. Um, generally, you'd want to perform your trait evaluations on the same kind of population that's representing what's going on in your production environment. Um, so, but then K, for example, cage growth, for instance, like are your triploid populations performing same as the diploids that you're evaluating your uh, traits on? Fortunately, there is evidence in the literature that generally speaking, those traits that perform well in the diploid families will also perform well in the triploid families. So on the whole, the options for you depend largely on what your traits of interest are and your operational setup and financial appetite. Um, so you, yeah, A, could you could evaluate your traits on a diploid population on the premise that generally speaking, your performance will trend the same for your triploid production, or B, you could produce triploid families, for example, and rear those separately until they can be individually tagged. So you are be, you'll be able to analyze triploids and um, back calculate the EBVs to the, to the diploid population, or we could use like more costly genotyping methods to try and go ahead and produce triploids. So there's a lot of different it's not as clear cut or straightforward, for example, in Atlantic salmon, where you know almost al always the case that you'll be pursuing uh, diploid populations. Uh, but it keeps our job interesting. Yes, absolutely. Um, we're coming into our audience Q and A time here, so maybe Maureen, I'll start with you on this audience question about how do you manage to ship delicate eggs? In your case, I guess milk on halfway across the world. So, what are your transport strategies? 
So basically, as long as it meets all the uh, disease screening requirements for the country that it's going into, uh, we have dry shippers that uh, have nitrogen vapor in them, and the uh, frozen milk goes into a dry shipper, and then it is shipped to its final destination. The dry shippers guarantee that that milk will stay frozen for up to uh, seven to 10 days. Okay. Um, Arlen, can I ask you a little bit about um, how you send genetics over to other farms? Um, so it really depends on where they're going, the distance that they're traveling. Um, if we are shipping out of province, for example, um, we're always shipping those on ice um, with a tray system so that the uh, ice is slowly melting over the course of their transport um, to maintain the, the, uh, the surface of the eggs. We only ship eyed eggs um, that way. When we're shipping amongst farms, um, it widely depends on the distance that I'm going between facilities. Um, they might go ready to go, um, as in they're, they're already in their heat stack um, and they're being shipped uh, exactly that way. I have some farms that are, you know, as, as little as five minutes away. Um, so it, it really varies. Um, again, we only move anything when it's eyed or when it's green. Um, green as in completely unfertilized. So if we have uh, another breeding facility that is bringing in um, material, then it is coming raw and we keep it at a, a temperature of about two degrees Celsius to maintain that. So, and as you can see, we have lots of coolers and lots of ice bags. <laughs> Sean, same question. Um, how do you ship river and eggs? Yeah, so we um, use kind of like a cooler that um, then the customer can reuse for other things. And that's probably why Arlen has so many coolers there <laughs> to supply her with. But uh, like she said, it's a it's a trade system. Um, we actually wrap the eyed eggs in like a cheesecloth material and then stack with layers of wet ice. Um, uh, so wet ice on top and uh, then a layer of eggs, wet ice, layer of eggs and such. Um, it, what you really... You can't ship uh, the eggs in in like water, a bag of water. They'll die within a minute or two. Um, but they can actually breathe the atmospheric air as long as the membrane around the egg, the egg shell is, is damp and moist. So uh, in that cooler that we have, we actually oxygenate uh, the bag and seal it. Uh, and um, we wrap it up in the coolers and, and put wet ice on it. And we can usually get up to... Uh, three to four days safely in transit. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, for you, Mar um, Marie, sorry, for Select, um, what is the farthest uh, place that Select Genetics have shipped to? So we don't ship any eggs. Uh, we're lit we literally just like manage the breeding programs for our oh, customers. So they, they deal with all that. That's a very quick answer. <laughs> Okay, perfect. <laughs> so we'll go to the next question then. Um, with much of the attention and development of genetics focusing on outdoor aquaculture success, how does the genetic and breeding process look different from a RAS? Okay, so maybe this is a question for Arlen and for Sean. Um, and I encourage, maybe I'll leave this uh, question as well for the RAS technology panelists later as well. Maybe they can weigh in. But um, yeah, maybe Arlen, I'll start with you. Um, how does the genetic and breeding process look different for a RAS system? Um. So when we're breeding for certain traits, um, RAS facilities usually have very, uh, very constant water temperatures, although they are prone to some oxygen related issues. Um, so we'll look at, you know, some families or strains that can handle that environment a little bit better. Um, when we're breeding, our whole program has evolutionized over outdoor. That, that has been the basis of everything that we do. Um, and that continues to be the main focus of what we do um, as RAS facilities are, are coming along. Um, and we have our, some of our own RAS, RAS and partial RAS systems um, for different units. Um, but we were exploring into that. We don't have a, a very firm, you know, clear, decisive picture. Again, we work with the grower. Um, we will try, you know, one or two different strains at a time and, and see if that's working for them. And if it's not, we can, you know, recalibrate as we go. But uh, again, everything that we do has been based on outdoor rearing. Um, and obviously, when you're you're dealing with outdoor rearing, there's a lot of uh, disease management as well that we're constantly looking at. So that would be a, a, a significant difference from the RAS look. Okay. Um, Sean, can you give us a little bit about... Um, uh, Riverance's RAS setup and how that's different from, you know, breeding for outdoor aquaculture? 
No, it, it is a good question. Um, how we kind of approach the outdoor areas, you know, it's an overall robustness of, of our uh, brood stock that goes out to many different environments. But when you start looking at the RAS systems, it's a much more catered program that we're looking at. We've trial, we're trialing with a couple of different um, farms in the United States where um, it's a more targeted uh, brood stock because you control all the variables in the RAS system. So it's more like I, I kind of related to like a, a chicken breeding program with a pole barn where you can control every single aspect in that pole barn. So you keep breeding the same genetics for that pole barn um, and you get good results. I think that's where, you know, the RAS and, and where uh, aquaculture is going and especially for breeding programs, there needs to be uh, and we're working on distinct breeding programs for RAS, so. Okay. Um, while I have you, Sean, there's a, a question here directed to you. Um, this person's interested in specific challenges you've found in creating an all-female coho population. Um, we're a trout event, but we'll let this coho question slide. <laughs> Would you be yeah, willing well, to say it, more a little bit about it? I'll make it quick then. No, it's been very challenging. Um, the difference between Atlantic salmon and rainbow trout is their repeat spawners, right? They, they can go back out to sea, come back in, spawn again in their natural environment. So that's what makes it where we can uh, make gains genetically and, and look at different things is that we can actually spawn that same individual a second year. You don't have that option with coho. So um, everything that we've tried with trying to get to uh, monosex or all female production, we only had it to use it on one generation. Uh, and then that generation dies and you kind of got to restart. So uh, in doing that, um, it was really hard to develop and know when the timing, when we saw success or not. And so it just took us a lot of generational time to figure out uh, where we needed to go. Uh, I think a lot of the species that are kind of that uh, one spawn and done, mostly the Pacific salmon species, uh, they tend to sterilize very, very easily compared to rainbow trout and Atlantics um, when you when you apply the treatment. So um, that was a major hurdle we had to get get over. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much, um, Marie. I'll ask this question to you first, and hopefully Arlen and Sean can weigh in with their perspective. Um, we have some question. We have a couple of questions here about um, broodstock feed management and strategies like that. Um, are you talking to, with your clients about um, broodstock feed uh, recommendations? Um, this person's asking, looking at the interaction between genetics and nutrition for the traits of interest. I think there's like some really interesting like academic work going on with uh, like, you know, for example, like the level of fish meal and like whether, you know, you can like almost like program your fish. Um, but I mean, ultimately, at the minute, I think most selective breeding programs like aren't really like quite fair, um, particularly for trout to like start introducing the, those kind of traits. Uh, and if that's what you mean in terms of like selective breeding for how like they interact with different feed types, um, in terms of like, um, I the think roots. they mean um, in terms of like broodstock nutrition. Um, mm -hmm. when when they're taking care of their booze truck and their feed management, um, are you involved in that part as well? Like, do you get data related? Yeah, to we certainly like. Um, it's one of the one of the things that I guess we have like on our checklist uh, when we're going through like setting up uh, with a customer, particularly for a customer probably new to it and hasn't been uh, running their own centralized breeding program. Like, just to make sure like the correct feed quality is there. Um, that the biosecurity is there as well um if it's, but yeah it, it's something we we are involved in i wanted to like make sure like um one of the previous questions as well like just to touch on like what they were talking about regarding like the ras system to make sure the area was covered in case that was the intention of the question sure, yeah, um of because, you know like a lot of um systems again like are outdoor at the minute but the reality is like for a lot of these centralized breeding programs they're probably operating in uh, RAS systems, especially like for egg suppliers, perhaps they're operating in RAS systems. Um, so for uh, when you're running a genetics breeding program, you will have like a sibling sentinel group. And um, so you're checking like what the performance is like in the production like environment um, and then taking that information and then mapping it back onto your like broodstock population. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, even if the broodstock are being reared in those RAS conditions, you know, those outdoor system criteria can can still be managed um it is beneficial to move i believe towards uh rest systems um 
the climate change uh, thing, you know, that, we're, that we keep talking about. Um, we are seeing like increasing like disruptions and storms for our customers, like in their flow through uh, systems. If that leads to like broodstock losses, then that's obviously going to be pretty disruptive for your immediate egg production and uh, introduce more of those inbreeding controls that I was talking about before. So overall, yeah, there's definitely a case for um, in increasing uh, better uh, RAS environmental regulation in your broodstock systems to make sure you still have that uh, seed supply, um, but still take that information from the outdoor systems um, that uh, that are relevant for your production population. Thanks for that, Marie. I'm just looking at my clock here and we're, we're about three minutes over our session here. So I want to get jump into our break for now. Um, thank you to our panelists, um, to all those who sent your questions. So hopefully our panelists can stay on for a few minutes and start um, can go into that Q&A box themselves and type in some responses for those that we didn't get to today. Um, we're going to take a short 10 minute, oh, seven minute break. When we come back, we will have our second panel moderated by Ben Norman to talk about grouse performance. But first, a word from our sponsor. See you soon. Hi, I'm Elie Settersmoen. I'm the CEO of Cryogenetics. Cryogenetics is the world leading provider of the cryo services to the salmonide industry. Uh, and we are present here uh, at the Trout Forum with uh, Maureen Ritter, our MD of uh, Canada. If you want to know more about our uh, services and products, please liaise with her later on. Thank you and welcome. 